Hi, everybody. I'm Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank, thank you, everyone, for staying through uh, you know, a couple of days of talking data all day, every day, for a few days. And you, you hung in there. And this is uh, awesome. And I think you deserve to give yourself a round of applause here. So, so. That's, that's really good. So I created an amazing presentation for you guys that I've been working on for weeks. And then about 2 o'clock in the morning, I got an email last night. And it totally made me change what I was going to say today. So what I'm going to say today, um, you'll be the first to hear it. Um, but it, it, it inspired me so much that I, I felt like I just couldn't let it go. You know, we're spending days talking about data and how important it is. And most of the people in the room have been dealing with data for maybe decades, right? And, um, and some of the talks, it's like, okay, here's how we can do it a little bit better. Here's how we could do it a little bit more efficiently. But I, I don't know if it's really been addressed. We are in an age right now that is probably, so just to back up for one second. So I've been doing this stuff for 32 years. So I've been like through the the whole, the, the leap from like mainframe to client server and then from client server to the internet and from, you know, relational databases and, you know, uh, unstructured databases and NoSQL databases and, and going from linear programming like COBOL to object oriented program that we're all using. And like all of these different things that, you know, really disrupt, you know, uh, third normal form modeling to versus dimensional modeling, which like, you know, we all love to talk about and have intellectual debates about. Um, and each one of those, right, was incredibly disruptive, probably to somebody's career in this room, if not all of our careers, right, over the years, right, talking about it, figuring out what's the right way to go and all of that. What we're on the cusp of right now for the past few years, um, but really just in the past year, with using data to make artificial intelligence applications like really drive the business. Like that is something that, if you took all of the disruption that we've had over the past 30 years and put it all together, I think it doesn't even scratch the surface of what we're about to embark on right now. Like it is really incredible. And the thing that, jumped, that made me think about this was at 2.30 in the morning, you can see the timestamp on the top, 2.14 a.m., I got this email from Bank of America. And I don't know if there's anybody from Bank of America in the room. There you go. So Bank of America, Erica is coming. Did you know about Erica? <laughs> so just curious, how long has Bank of America been working on Erica? And if you're not comfortable. They, they rolled it out to employees uh, a few months ago. A few months ago, yeah. And um, so I think... If, I'm not a betting man, but if I had to bet, I would guess last year they weren't talking about Erica. They were not, right? So the speed of which things are happening today where they're going from not only just like building new reports and building new dashboards, changing the way they do business from a couple of months ago to now. And, and it's so important that it's not even done yet. And they're telling the general population, right, we're doing this because it needs to be done. Right? It's really, we're really on a cusp of something huge here, and all of us are going to be, we're going to be impacted by it, and we're also going to impact the change. And that's what I want to talk about. Is that cool? Go. Yeah? Go. <laughs> so I want to start with another little pet passion that I have, which is I, 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 in my spare time, I, I build reef aquariums. And... Um, and the symbiotic relationship between a clownfish and an anemone. Anybody know what's special about this? What's really, really cool about this? This should never, ever happen. Right? This should never happen. Um, clownfish should eat the anemone, and the anemone are poisonous. They should sting the clownfish, and, and the clownfish would die. But, but for some reason, right, over the course of time, they realized that they're actually more prosperous together than they are if they, if they compete. And, um, and it took time, and it takes a little bit of stinging, right? And eventually, the clownfish built an immunity to an enemy poison, 
and now they live happily ever after in an environment where the, the anemone protects the fish from the other bigger fish, and, uh, and the clownfish actually provides nutrients. I won't get into how the disgusting way that they do that, but, um, but and, they, and they have like a very, very happy community together now. And I think this, this is really very much like how we're dealing with artificial intelligence. I think there's a lot of fear with artificial intelligence. I think the general population thinks that their job is gonna be replaced by a robot. And I think that there is some truth to that. I think, you know, me and Mike over here who works for Caserta, we've dealt with some customer service issues in our trip from New York to Boston. And we were thinking, you know, if there was a robot here, they'd probably care a little bit more that they're not doing what we need them to do. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, you can train machines to do things. Um, and machines, as we know now, uh, you know, based on some of the courses and what we've been learning in our career, we can, and, you know, through Erica and, and Alexa and Siri, like, as we use them, the more they get to realize the behaviors that we like, and then they start adapting to the behaviors that we like. And they're doing what we want instead of us having to accommodate what they want when they're supposed to be serving us, right? And I think that there's a lot to be learned for, about that. And, um, and I think that, you know, the using data in order to make machines smarter, right? is the basis of everything, everything going forward. Like, you know, and we've been saying this again, for, for some of the things have changed dramatically and some of the things have just remained the same. One of the things that remain the same is without good data, you're not gonna have a smart robot, right? Or you're not gonna have good intelligence. Erica, I'm sure probably the biggest, the biggest part of that project was feeding her the right information so that she can give the customers, you know, good, you know, she's giving new information that she's creating based on information that already happened. If that basis or information is wrong, her, all of her recommendations are gonna be wrong, right? And any customer experience is gonna be wrong. So we still need to rely on good data. I wanna give a little bit of uh, background on where we're getting data and why it's so exciting now too, is uh, there's a guy named Chris Dancy. Everybody, anybody ever hear of Chris Dancy? Chris Dancy, he's known as the human cyborg. So who in the room either is wearing a Fitbit or looks on their phone once in a while to see like how many steps they've, they've walked? Wow, almost all of you, cool. Um, so Chris Dancy took that to the next, probably not the next, the nth level. So he actually has 700 sensors attached to his body and around him and he is collecting data about everything, everything about him. And this is something that I have been thinking about for years, you know, this day and age, how do we not know, like when we eat, how do we not know exactly what we should be eating by now? It's like 20, 2018, right? How do we not know exactly, like why are we eating? What, why are we putting food in our mouth? What nutritional value does, should this food have? How much like protein and niacin and magnesium and sugar should I have in order to function? I believe we should know by now. Like, and, and we just eat blindly because it tastes good. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, you know, Chris Dancy has kind of the same opinion as I have, but only he's took it, taken it to another level. He's actually trying to figure it out. Um, you know, so I, and the way he says it is all of this information, like what's our heart rate, what's our pulse, what's our, how many steps do we take, you know, um, you know, what's the oxygen level in our blood, all of this information, it's always existed, right? It's always been there. The only thing that's changed over the past few years is now we have the, the ability to harness it and, and collect it, right? And I think that within business, there's business interactions all around us every day, even right now. You know, that one person is walking up out of the room because she's had enough of me. I'm teasing, totally. I'm, I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but that happened, right? An event just happened and it's gone forever, poof. I think that there will be a day where everything that happens, right, is going to be recorded and we'll be able to trend it and we'll be able to make machines smarter to do things better. 
um, and make ourselves smarter to do things better. And I think that has to be the key too. I think if we rely de wholly dependent on machines and robots and artificial intelligence, then we're just going to become, you know, the, the dumbest race on Earth instead of the smartest race on Earth. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, th the thought of invisible data and making it visible, that's our job. Like, that to, you know, from this point forward, like what has changed in this, in this conference, we've decided, hopefully, that we're going to make invisible data visible to people who care about it, right? And that's, as data people, like that's, that's cool. That's very, very cool. So this guy, Michio Kaku, he's a theoretical physicist based in New York City. And um, you know, his prediction is that artificial intelligence will actually start to be something that maybe we should be worried about. Um, but he feels like probably not in our lifetime. And if you think about like some of the, art, the examples of artificial intelligence, and even no offense to Erica or Siri or Alexa, there's a lot of times where like they'll say something and we think, well, that's ridiculous, right? And, and you know, to quote Michio Kaku, he says, artificial intelligence today is about as intelligent as a retarded cockroach, <laughs> which, you know, which is good and bad. It's, it's bad because we're starting to depend, depend on it more and more. What's good is because in our field, there's nothing but up. Like we can only make things better. Like the core is there, technologies are there, the uh, processes is there, are there, but, but advancing it is like that's to me, I mean hopefully that makes your propeller spin, right? And, um, and that is very, very exciting. And I think the people in this room are some of the people who hopefully are gonna influence changing the world with artificial intelligence and with data and, um, and make, you know, a couple years down the road, Michelle Kaku is going to say, yeah, they're probably smart, at least as a normal cockroach. <laughs> so what are we doing with it today? You know, um, there's a saying, uh, the guy, what's his name, Rudy Dornbush, a uh, famous economist, he said, things always take longer than they thought, than you thought they would, and then they happen faster than, they, than you thought they ever could. Right? And that's a very famous saying. And I think artificial intelligence is like the epitome of that saying because we've been talking about AI for decades, right? Since probably the 70s, we've been talking about it and afraid of it and all of that. But really, it didn't start happening until last year, maybe even this year. And you could tell by the email from Bank of America, like, it not only is it just, it just started happening and now it's already changing the way they do business. Like one of the biggest banks in the world. They're, they decided we're just gonna change and we're going to make artificial intelligence the core of how we interact with our customers. That's massive, right? And you could think of like all of the other companies that are gonna follow suit as soon as that thing goes live. They have to, otherwise they won't be able to compete. Like if you're not using artificial intelligence in your competitive strategy, right now, at least have it on your roadmap, you're probably not gonna be in business much longer. You know, it's just, it's that pervasive throughout our society. I truly believe that. 77% um, of all business leaders are saying artificial intelligence is, is something that is going to make, give them some kind of business advantage. And 61% of them are, are, say, are actually doing something with their data using artificial intelligence. Um, as simple as, you know, there's a, uh, there's a company out there called Tamer uh, by Michael, created by Michael Stonebreaker. You know, they're using artificial intelligence. We used to, you know, as a data guy, some of you probably know I wrote the Data Warehouse ETL Toolkit, right, years ago. And a lot of that book is about, okay, how do you integrate all of this data? Well, Tamer wrote some artificial intelligence, at least if you, don't know, if you don't want to call it AI, very sophisticated machine learning, so that when you bring data sets together, it will go through and it will learn which data sets are associated to other data sets. Right? So a lot of the techniques that we've been using really are going to become obsolete pretty soon. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? That's just the tip. 
Like every time we interact with data, we spent, you know, the, l the last 30 years, we spent so much time cleaning, conforming, consolidating, collecting, like getting all of this data. And now guys like Chris Dancy, they're just collecting it, right? And, um, and, uh, and you know, Michio Kaku says that, you know, we just, it will be a famous quote that he said is, data and information, it will be everywhere and it will be nowhere. Right, so what we're going to start doing is just collecting our movements based on our movements. If you think of the evolution of virtual reality, where we had like the, the goggles and then the, uh, the handheld machines, and now you don't even need the handheld machines anymore, right? You could just use your natural human hands and you can interact with, art, with virtual reality. It's not gonna be long, it's not a stretch of the imagination where you're not gonna need those goggles where you could put VR directly in a contact lens and you could walk around in a virtual world, All right? Um, wanna see something really cool? Yeah. Check it out, I'll see, I'll see, I just found this like as I was sitting in the back over there, but I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's really awesome. Um, this one, check this out. So this is augmented reality art. So this is an art exhibit, and it's all just paintings on the wall. But if you hold a phone or an iPad in front of that piece of art, it actually starts moving. So you could think of like augmented reality where if, you, if, you only, if your purview is only that phone, right, you would think that it's really moving. You would have no idea that it's static. Right. So when it sees the artwork, it triggers animation and sound. So it brings the that cool? to life. So, so you, and look how young. That's insane. So you could think if, let me go back to this. If we're able to do augmented reality through contact lens, Right? and we're collecting data right, through space. It's not a, it's not, it's not a stretch to, to learn quickly that like the difference between reality and virtual reality, it's gonna start to get very, very gray. Like, you know, instead of the fights over like, well, is that an operational report or an analytic report, right? <laughs> Glad somebody got that one. Um, I've spent hours, countless hours. Is this operational reporting or analytic reporting? Um, right? And now we're gonna say, is this reality? <laughs> right? Or is this virtual reality? Right? And maybe it won't even matter at some point, right? So one, so one thing for sure is that it's happening, right? And, it, and it's not, I, I think, you know, in order for us to succeed as humans, we have to embrace what's happening, right? It's gonna happen. And I just wanted to point out, and I have some cheat sheets, so I may read a little bit, but some of the things that people were afraid of and people were naysayed, nay, naysayed about um, in the past. So one thing is the light bulb. So the light bulb was created um, by Thomas Edison, as everybody knows, and it was the English scholars. That's right, right? <laughs> no? Who created the light bulb? Oh, was it Marconi? Was it Tesla? It was one of those three guys. One of those three guys. Okay, it was created nonetheless. <laughs> and um, but but when it was first created, it was said that um, there would never be a practical use for it. Like we have candles, we have the sun. Like what do we need light bulbs for? It's ridiculous, right? And and plus the complexities of running a light bulb requires electricity, which is another thing that was like people, you know, if you think about electricity, right? All of the work that goes into creating electricity. And electricity is all around us, right? I have light right here. There's light in this space right here. Right? There's no wires, there's no way to measure, but it's there, right? You can get one of those lumens measurers and say, yeah, there actually is some light there, 
right? But if you think about like what it takes to actually create electricity and light and all of that, right? It's, uh, it's, it's monumental, but it's something that nobody thinks about, right? Nobody in this room thinks about, how did that light bulb actually get turned on? Where's the source of that power? Where did we get it? Is that clean electricity? You know, it's like, eventually we're gonna start thinking about data the same way. It's like, we're just gonna have it, we're gonna experience it, we're gonna use it, you know? Did it come from a solar panel or did it come from a dam or, you know? I don't think, did it come from coal or did it come from, you know, like, I don't know, you know, if it, we spend so much time today, you know, is it in Hadoop? Is it on the cloud? Is it in Oracle? Like, it's so important to us right now. I think eventually, it's even starting now. Like, it's starting to matter less and less and less. Like, you know, it used to be a big part of our project would be creating this, this, this wonderful, remarkable data model that solved all, the, all of life's problems, right? And now, you know, with the new technologies, the data model is like the thing we think about not the least, but it's not nearly as important as it was 10 years ago. Not at all. Um, and I think that's gonna, that evolution is gonna continue and that trend is gonna continue. What's another fun one? The airplane. The airplane, they said that there would never ever be a military use. Like you could never see, like how would we get things up in the sky? It didn't make any sense to anybody, right? For military use. Um, the personal computer is the obvious one, right? Um, Watson. The, the founder of IBM said he could never see a personal computer in somebody's house. Right? The whole world would never need more than five computers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and my favorite is da uh, Daryl Zanuck, who is the uh, executive director of 20th Fox in 1946. He said the television is a passing fad. In 1946, he said, people are just gonna get sick of watching like a plywood box in their house. And, um, and, you know, he just, he just didn't have that vision, right? And what's really funny is the way the world works, he's kind of right now, but, but, uh, but it, took a, it took a very, very long time to get there. Um, so he, here's a, a, like something opposite where we were overly optimistic and it never really happened. One is Bill Gates. Bill Gates said that, I think it was what year was in the 80s, or 2004, he said. 2004, Bill Gates said that within two years, we will have spam completely under control, that we won't have to deal with spam ever again. Yeah, it would be nice. But I think the only hope for us to have spam under control is artificial intelligence. Right, we've tried 100 different ways doing it ourselves. We just couldn't do it. I think with AI, we could probably do it. But if you think of the wheel, the automobile, the steam engine, the steam engine People thought that if you went too fast, your face would actually melt off, your skin would melt off your face with the invention of steam engines. X-rays, right, the refrigerator, like all of these really monumental changes all were doubted when they first started. And I think, I think you know, we're right on the cusp of, of something huge that's just in line with all of those great things that changed the way we live today. So if we unite, if we can unite, um, I think that if we think about like other major societal changes that have impact us, impacted us over the years, like you know when the steam engine, we talked about the steam engine, the introduction of like water and steam to power things, right? That was the start of the, a, um, the industrial revolution. I was gonna say the revolutionary war, but it wasn't that one. It was the industrial revolution, right? The industrial revolution and then when we had electricity um, powering um, assembly lines, right? That was also another thing. Everybody thought they were gonna lose their job. And, and a lot of people did, right? But, but we got through it, right? We came out the other side and we're in a better place now than we were back then doing everything by hand, right? And, um, and you know, people got retrained. Yes, the, you know, the mining companies and stuff maybe lost their jobs, but, um, but you know, people wound up, I think society is in a better place now. Since the things like steam, steam electricity and steam power and electric power and assembly lines. And then with electronics and you know, IT and giving everybody here, like if, that, if those first couple of things didn't happen, nobody would be in this room right now. Right? We would not have the jobs that we do today 
if we didn't have the baby steps it took to go from steam to electricity to automation. And now the next step is like combining automation with like physical um, advancements and cyber, cyber physical advancements and creating artificial intelligence. And I think that is the very progressive, very natural, organic next step in, in the industrial revolution. So, I just want to talk about um, what can we do? Like, what are the possibilities? And you know, there's a few things that are near and dear to my heart. One in particular is healthcare. And I think if we think about healthcare and we think about data and we think about how we do healthcare today, it's kind of crazy. I don't know. For me, it's crazy that if I have you know, not, maybe not even a chronic illness, but an illness, I'm sick, and I need to figure out what is the cure, I go to some guy who lives in my neighborhood who has his own world experience on what he thinks my, my cure, what my symptoms are. Like, is it in, like with today's technology, isn't that crazy? I, I don't know, I find that to be crazy. I think we have information of everything that, I, that could possibly be wrong with me is in data and all of the symptoms and all of the procedures that have worked and that has has not worked it's all there it's all there for the taking and i think if we can train and when i say machines i mean just some artificial intelligence algorithms to take all of that information feed it through the machine and say here's all my symptoms and what is what is the prognosis do you think I don't know how that could be worse than this guy who just has this very narrow view and world experience, right? His own little experience, right? If you think of his, right? He went to school probably 30 years ago, and he's been seeing a couple of people in my area, and that's how he's been like progressing his career. And if he comes across something he hasn't encountered before, he'll ask some of his peers that he met like anecdotally in his life, right? And and this is our lives that we're talking about. And I feel like artificial intelligence can absolutely, without a doubt, improve that process, right? Um, and education, education is another big one for me. You know, that you have, you know, 30, for me, I went to school in New York City, 40 people in the same room, listening to a single teacher teaching curriculum a single way and if you learn, if you have a different learning style from the way they're teaching, too bad, you're out of luck, right? And I think artificial intelligence can actually help teach, right? It can actually maybe not replace a human teacher, although personally I think some of the human teachers I've had could easily be replaced. Um, but, uh, you know, but at least augment, right, the human teacher to say, okay, Here's the curriculum and be able through interactions say, okay, if you're, let's teach you this learning style. And there's only like six or seven different learning styles, whether it's visual or audible or, or like emotional or through uh, interactions, right, physical. And I know for me personally, there's some things I see it, I know it forever. And there's other things I need to hear it, right? And there's other things where once I read it and get through it, like, and it's all different, like math versus science versus different topics, whether it holds my interest or whether it's just forced learning, like all of these different things need to be considered. And I think we can easily feed a machine and get a very individual type of structure, teaching structure, rather than to have one person in the front of the room try to accommodate 40 different personalities. I think there's tremendous opportunity for that. So the only way these, any of these machines are going to get smarter is through data. And luckily, everybody in a room's job is data. So I think we're all pretty safe. But I, th <laughs> but I think it's, all, it's very, very, very exciting. And I think the amount of stuff that you're going to learn between you know, maybe last year and the next five years will be probably more than you've ever learned in your entire career and probably the whole rest of your life. Um, you know, and I think our job and our responsibility as data practitioners is to keep learning and to keep learning and to keep advancing um, and to bring the people who are, hold us responsible for that advancement, bring them to where they need to be. How are we doing on time? Cool. Um, 
Yeah, I just, I just made a quick note. I want to say that bad data equals bad artificial intelligence, right? So, you know, some of the pra practices that we've learned over the years, you know, where we want to have good, clean data, I mean, it's still, it's still appropriate. Like, if we think of that virtual assistant that Bank of America is rolling out, with bad data, it's going to give bad advice, and then business is going to go down, not up. You know, I know for me, if I open up an app and it's not specifically catered to my needs, I'm going to find another store or another business to do business with because I don't have time to deal with things that are not appropriate for me. Right? And I think every business in the world is starting to feel like that, right? That, you know, custom individual experience for every single human being, right? That's the goal. And the only way to do that is through data, right? And through artificial intelligence. So life is hard. <laughs> it's harder if you're stupid. <laughs> I love this one. Um, so yeah, so I, I, do, I believe that we have to keep getting smarter. Um, the machines are not going to get dumber, you know? And it's funny, I once gave a uh, commencement, I went to, I was born and raised in the Bronx in New York City in the 70s, like the worst possible schools there are, there are especially at the time. And, um, and I went back after I've m made, you know, the success that I have today, I went back and I gave a commencement speech to the kids in the school uh, at their graduation. And I said, you know, and in the inner city school, there's like drugs and gangs and all this stuff. And, I always, and I, what I said to them was, if there is life on other planets, do you think that they take substances that, that make themselves stupider, right? And that's what we do. We're like actually getting dumber. And what we're doing is we're consuming information that makes us stupider. Like, you know, we have, like on this phone, we have like the world's information, all of the greatest inventions and philosophers and anything you ever want is right here. And we use it to like look at kittens, right? <laughs> right? Or we look at like, what is Kardashian wearing today? And I think that, I think, you know, I think competition is good. You know, we talk about the cloud and we talk about Amazon and Google and Microsoft. And I think it's great that like Amazon doesn't have the, isn't the leader or they're still the leader, but they have like these very serious competitors now because it's making them all better, right? They're all going to keep trying to leapfrog each other to keep the market. And I think when humans are the master race, we kind of got complacent. We're kind of dumb. Right? If you think of like the overall, especially American population, like have, being really, really smart is not one of the top priorities in our life. Right? But now we have a competitor. Now we have artificial intelligence. Now we have to step up our game. Right? And I think that's really, really important to communicate to the world is that now we have to step up our game. We need to get smarter. And you know, the irony of it is we could use artificial intelligence to get smarter than artificial intelligence, right? rather than the other way around. Right? So imagine the possibilities of the things we could do. We talked a little bit about the education system. Legal system, like law, to me, law is one big decision tree. If we have all the information and all of the different cases that have happened in the past, and we can feed a machine all of those cases and all of those outcomes. Everything that happens already happened. Right? It's very rare that something new in the legal system happens that hasn't already happened. It's just a decision tree. Right? Why do we need to pay high paid lawyers to do that? Like that's something I think the, the medical field and the legal field, I think they're going to be impacted, like hit hard. with artificial. That's just my own personal prediction. Um, investment strategies, we already see it. Bank of America's uh, Erica may replace some jobs of these high paid investment brokers and uh, advisors. And um, everything from like claims fraud detection to chronic illness and everything in between, I think is, is, is free game for, for using data coupled with artificial intelligence to change the way we do things. And I think everybody in this room is really in an amazing place right now to be able to advance themselves and advance the world. 
Um, and Einstein saying, say, says, uh, well, life is like riding a bicycle. You, you keep your balance by moving forward. And in this day and age, in the, in the world of data, there's no standing still. You're either going forward or you're going backwards because everybody else is, is, on a, is on a forward plane. Right? So if, you, if you're standing still, you're actually drifting backwards. Right? So we want to keep moving forward. So um, that's all I have. So, uh, so just in case anybody wants to get in touch with me, Joe Caserta, Twitter, Joe underscore Caserta. I own a consulting firm that, uh, you know, this is the stuff we do. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. I'd be more than happy to take a question or two if anybody wants. I know that me, yes, yes. Well, Russia has Snowden. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, I predict that all of this n nonsense going on with the with the uh, with the uh, voting and the elections and all that, I think it's going to tie back to Snowden someday. That's my personal opinion. What about China but, versus the US? They're the kind of the right? Yeah, um, I don't know. You know, the thing that the U.S. has that the others, I don't, I don't, I'm not educated enough to know like how they do it, but, but I know the reason why the US is so advanced in the higher ed is because of the, because of the visa, visa H-1B status, right? Getting people from other countries who understand how important it is. The thing we do have is like, we have the MITs and we have some great, great, especially in Boston, right? We have Harvard, right? We have some great schools. Um, what we need is people who actually want to go to them and actually learn, right? And I think the discipline through a lifetime in China is way better, right? And most other countries is way better, like drilling in how important education is. Education is you don't get good grades so you can go to a good party school, right? You get good grades so that you can actually change, change the world and support yourself and support your family and, you know, and, and, and be great at whatever it is you decide to be great at, right? And that's something I think we lost. I feel like we had that at some point, but I feel like we kind of lost that last few years. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I had, uh, I had a couple of questions. Yes. For my esteemed colleague from the back of America. Yeah. <laughs> So the question, the question is, you know, big giant banks like Bank of America, they have the resources to go get like the engineers and the scientists to do this type of innovation. The small businesses are that what's going to happen. In my, in my experience, so I've had Caserta for 17 years, the real innovation happens in the small companies. But because the big bank, nothing against Bank of America at all, but big giant banks and big giant organizations in general, it's like trying to shift the Titanic, right? They're just, they've become so direct on a path and the whole entire th hundreds of thousands of people are on this same journey to get them to be nimble and shift to say, okay, yesterday we were doing things this way, today we're gonna shift and do them that way. It's impossible. They can't, they can't possibly be, be that nimble. Right. So, so I think, but I think what's happening is, at least in my experience, the big giant banks and the big giant organizations, they've realized this. They probably started realizing this since the introduction of big data, right? And since we started seeing some real innovation, right, in the past, since like 2011, right? 2009 maybe, right? But 2011. And they started changing the way they're structured inside. And inside, they're starting to look and feel more like an agile small company. Right, but it's very hard.
Yeah. That leads to information quality. Yeah. So I do think the garbage in, garbage out philosophy still applies. I think what's changing now, instead of doing it manually and, and depending on human intervention and conventional wisdom to say this is right or this is wrong, it's automate, 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 automate. And I think a lot of the innovation like in our world, like immediately is like the automation of data quality and using AI to do it. Sure, of course. Yeah. And the other point is that uh, I believe you implied it, that artificial intelligence could be a very good means to clean data before you feed it. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Any anyone else? Questions? Well, one, and this is, gets into a philosophical debate, which is always better over like a beer. But, um, but I, think, I think one of the biggest challenges isn't technical, it's, it's that type of stuff. And I think that our government is way, 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 way behind keeping, it, keeping us safe, right? Because technology is moving so fast. And I think that it's not that it's wrong, that's the challenge, it's that it's corrupt. That's the challenge. Because the people building these machines and building these algorithms and feeding these data are human beings with an agenda, right? And, and pe whenever we have human beings with an agenda, hopefully it's all for good, but it's not always all for good, right? And I don't think our government is keeping up to when it's not for the good and when it is absolutely for the bad, how do we stop that from happening? And I think that's, probably could be another good conference to talk about, yeah. Other questions for Joe? Comments? Your own views on this? It's getting late in the afternoon. Yeah, I'll let you go home. Into really interesting <laughs> days of learning and finding out new things, uh, meeting new people, I hope, making connections. So first of all, let me thank Joe very much for his insights Data. Thank you. Thanks. And thank all of you for coming. Um, there is a very good possibility. No, I, I'm not saying this in public, right? No, nobody's listening, right? right? <laughs> but there's a very good chance that next May, the same week, we will be back here in the same hotel for next year's data summit and probably the competing summit conferences. Cool. So. I'm crossing my fingers that this happens. Okay? <laughs> so, thank you all for coming. See you next year.